Hello, I'm Tracy Kutcher. I'm the director curator at Salmon Arm Art Gallery. And today we're so very fortunate to be joined by John G. Woods. You know, there's other John Woods in town, so uh, who has a PhD in zoology. Welcome, John. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to meet you and talk with you because at the Art Gallery, while we're presenting a, a whole lot of online content about art and the environment that we live in, uh, the month of May is our bird theme. And when I learned that you and Jeff Stiles were creating a course for Songbird ID, it was just very exciting and so timely. Um, unfortunately, I know that because of the pandemic and all of the shutdowns, you weren't able to offer the course right now, but I'd love to talk a little bit about more of that. Um, but before that, can you tell us just a little bit about your background and how you got so interested in songbirds? Well, uh, my interest started fairly early when I was about 13 years old. I um, got a pair of binoculars, acquired a pair of binoculars, and I, I think they're for various purposes like boating and whatnot. But I uh, soon discovered, as soon as I got binoculars, that I started to get fabulous looks at birds. And um, they were all around me, and I was the kind of kid that loved to explore every ravine and woodlot lot and place that I could in southern Ontario. And so very quickly, uh, being able to look at birds closely through binoculars just uh, hooked me on it. And there was a very supportive group of people in, I was brought up in Toronto, and there were a very supportive group of people at the Royal Ontario Museum. And they had a junior naturalist club that met every Saturday morning. So uh, with meeting some of these people on the, in this club, uh, they in, course encourage, I think every naturalist on earth encourages young people to be involved in nature. Uh, I was able to go out and get on outings and uh, use it as part of my venture. I've always been really keen on every aspect of the outdoors and the, the quest, uh, originally the quest to find something new and different that I hadn't seen before was uh, uh, something that sort of guided me through my teenage years and I went into a university and took a biology degree and uh, then took another one uh, uh, studying something not not birds uh, studying elk in the Canadian Rockies but uh, birds have always been my earliest fascination with nature. Hmm. Yeah I was looking at your thesis and thought that was interesting elk, elk migratory patterns in the Rockies and how does that compare to how does that? Yes. What am I doing with birds? You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well I, I'm a, first and foremost a biologist so a biologist is someone who studies life. So all forms of life are fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. So birds are one of the most uh, long enduring interests of mine. And I've done research in birds, uh, but I've also studied uh, elk in the Rockies. I've studied uh, intensively uh, grizzly bears in the Rockies and the Columbia Mountains uh, and caribou and wolves and bats. And um, I think someday I'll, I'll know what I want to study uh, forever when I, when I grow up sort of thing, but I find all of life interesting, but birds are so accessible. I think what makes them wonderful is wherever you go, there's beautiful uh, birds uh, out the door. And this time of the year, you couldn't have picked a better month than May to feature birds because we have an explosion of birds uh, arriving in the Northern part of North America, uh, Central and North America and Northern North America who've wintered in the South and they're filling our eyes with uh, spectacular beauty and our ears with spectacular sounds. Yes, absolutely. I know we're right in the middle of the migratory season. So it's a, a special time. Sometimes we get to see birds that might only stop in the shoe swap for a few days and, and then off they go to the higher levels in the Alpine maybe, but it is. Or the, or the, or the Arctic. Yeah, that's right. Or, or, or the high Arctic, you know. Um, Salmon Arm is an exceptional place for bird watching. Oh, wow. Well, that's kind of exciting it's, to know. So is that, yeah. is that something that maybe brought you here to Salmon Arm? Like, why did you come to Salmon Arm to settle? Uh, I came to Salmon Arm because uh, my, my um, daughter and her family, my grandchildren, ah. live here. And because I've always liked Salmon Arm. Uh, my wife and I have spent uh, more than, what, 44 years, I guess, in, in Revelstoke. Uh, where I've worked for the national parks there uh, as a scientist. And uh, we love Revelstoke. But we've always liked Salmon Arm, but we've never spent much time here. And then when our kids moved here, we realized, well, one, we could be closer to them here, of course, than 
on the other side of Eagle Pass. And two, this is a fabulous place for bird watching. Mm -hmm. uh, year round, the lake, uh, the mountains, the being at the north end of the Okanagan, being on the doorstep of the Caribou. Salmon Arm is in fact known, um, probably continental wide, as a fabulous place to bird watch in the interior of uh, British Columbia. Wow, that's exciting yeah. to know. Yeah, well I know we're a little bit famous for the grebes, for the western grebe, uh, but I know that there's so many more species that can be spotted here that may be really rare other places. Well, it's not just the rarity. I mean, this is a, the, the, the wharf is a fabulous place. And if you go out to the wharf, if you like walking the wharf, you've probably seen people bird watching. Um, I see people bird watching every time I go out there. And if they don't have binoculars, they're asking me like, what is that, you know? And, or telling me a story about the eagles and the <laughs> pelicans last year that we had. Yeah. But uh, amongst the naturalists and the, and the bird watchers of North America, Salmon Arm stands out. Uh, because uh, particularly the, of the lake and the shoreline of the lake. But what I'm finding uh, living here now is that it's uh, fabulous for land birds as well. Mm. Nice. Okay, well, tell us about the Birdsong ID course that you were developing with Jeff Stiles. Well, this was really uh, Jeff Stiles' idea in the spring. Um, Jeff took a course that I offered in Revelstoke uh, for the last few years. Uh, and that was canceled because of the, uh, the COVID-19. Um, he, uh, he is another very avid bird listener. Uh, well, let's back up a bit. People who call themselves bird watchers, it's usually a little bit of a misnomer. Yeah. <laughs> the keenest of them are bird listeners. All right, so hearing the birds is a, a huge part of detecting and ident identifying them. And Jeff uh, is a kindred spirit in the sense of he loves everything about bird song. And when he took the course as a student, uh, he and I became friends and uh, started doing a few things together. And he thought it would be wonderful to bring to uh, Salmon Arm the opportunity for the local, um, local people who are interested in birds and local naturalists who would like to go the next step. And the next step in bird watching is after you, you know, get a pair of binoculars, get a bird book, start knowing birds by sight, then the next step is by sound. So in fact, all the keenest um, birders uh, in North America know the birds' songs. And what you soon discover is you actually end up identifying more and more accurately birds by sound than you can by sight. So he thought, he wanted to bring this to Salmon Arm as an opportunity. Fabulous. Well, and it's, it makes perfect sense because birds are tiny and sometimes they're camouflaged. And so to be able to hear them and identify them gives you an extra clue of what you're looking for. Yeah, or, or the essential clue for what you're looking for because some birds can look identical, but they sound totally differently. So, so his idea was, let's just test the waters. And right away, he had uh, more than 20 people that were keen on taking the bird course, which was going to be several Sunday mornings through April and May, where we went out together and listened to birds, recorded their songs. And then we went up, we were going to go to the, uh, the school, the uh, South Canoe School, and then do a bit of a lab session where we can listen to the birds and bring up the images of their songs on the screen and everybody can see visualization of sound as well as hearing the sound. Right. Yeah. And so that was going to be the model. And then when we had to abandon that model, because you cannot get uh, 22 or three or four people together along, say, Raven Trail and, and, and uh, appropriately distance each other uh, in our current times. Um, we thought, well, let's just tell, let's have an informal email connectivity with the group. And we'll just give them emails uh, every week or two and um, try to get them or, or teach them through, through, through the email uh, network uh, how to use their smartphones to record birds. And then they can record ones they don't know and send them in. And we can all try to figure them out and work our way through the same period of time in April and May, but just never actually physically meeting yeah. each other. Yeah, we're so, pretty inventive right now on how we're gonna, how we're gonna yeah. share and learn from each other. Yeah, and the next step of this might be, uh, we were talking about Zoom a, a few moments ago, 
It might be to actually try um, a session with them where they can dial in and learn to use some of the software where we can demonstrate it. That's what we would have been doing at the South Canoe Elementary, right. demonstrating the software. Uh, that's, it's really hard to describe that all in an email text. Yeah. <laughs> but he's, so but that's where we think we're going. And, and uh, you know, everybody has a, a different degree of busyness right now, but generally lots and lots of people are bird watching and bird listening. And we've had good interaction with the, with the students Excellent. on this. So, uh, and, and, I'm learning, and I'm learning how to, how to sort of uh, field a whole bunch of people that I, uh, questions from that, uh, people I've never met. And some of them I feel like I've met now <laughs> because we've had enough correspondence together. Yeah. So you bring up the software topic. Now, there's a lot of apps that you can get on your phone that claim to be able to identify birds. And I did download one of these one time and I didn't find it very effective because of course you need to have a, a volume of song that you're hearing before it really will register. Um, but is there anything, is there advancements in that that people can look into? Is there anything you recommend that would be helpful in identifying bird song? Um, yes, but uh, it's not necessarily an app. Uh, what, what, I, what I recommend is a very basic approach where if you hear a bird you don't know, you track it down and watch it sing. Oh. Yes, you take the time to actually, and for example, everybody in Salmon Arm would have a, probably a song sparrow singing somewhere today outside their house. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't know that one, you would hear it and get closer and look at it and then watch it sing. Ideally, then use your, your smartphone to record it while you're watching it sing. And by watching it sing, I mean watching its bill. That's what I always tell the students. You're not just looking for the bird. I want you to see the bill moving while it's singing. And the reason for that is to make sure that what you're looking at is what you're hearing. Ah. <laughs> and if you do that, if you start doing that, particularly early in the year, when there's only a few to be found, you start uh, recognizing birds that you know by voice. All right, just like you and I have only met a few minutes ago, but I already know probably you, better, you quite well by voice. <laughs> you know, if I heard you on the radio, I'd go, oh, you know, that's Tracy. Oh, so, uh, so what you're trying to do is get that. Now, if you just want to identify the bird, uh, then the next best thing to an app is to record it, with, make a recording, and then every community has a network of bird watchers. And I haven't met a bird watcher yet who didn't try to help someone else out if they had an unknown bird. So when somebody says to me, well, there's this bird that goes squawk, 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 or tweet, 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 <laughs> the next thing I, I ask is, or I saw this black-headed bird with a red on the tail and blue this and that, I, I start with, did you take a picture of it? Well, if it's a sound, I, did you take a recording of it? Yeah. And I've had people f phone me and hold their, 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 uh, their smartphones up in the air towards the bird so I could hear it over, <laughs> over the phone. So that's, that's something you could do as well. Yeah. You have to really sink in. Oh, yeah. And that's why when I go out, like yesterday I was out with, 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 a, with a friend on a big wide logging road so we could take either side of it where there was no traffic. And we must have encountered oh, 20 or more orange crowned warblers. Oh, wow. By song, by song. We saw a few, but more than 20 by song. And by the end of it, he, he was getting it. He was getting it. That's the voice of an orange crowned warbler. Oh. There's a pattern and a voice. So I don't personally think there's a lot of shortcuts with apps. There's ones that can be helpful. And the written descriptions are generally not much help because the human language was not designed to convey bird language. Oh, absolutely. And I know that one of the helpful things on the Cornell Labs uh, website is to use nanomics to try to um, help you remember what the bird sounded like. So, and then I don't know if you know of Kathy Stubbington and her work down at Runaway Moon Theatre, but she's done a number of bird related projects. And one of her things, um, one of her projects was the bird chorus and she uh, created uh, like song and words that help you remember the songs of birds. 
So for instance, um, to remember what the robin sounds like, her, her words are cheerio, cheerily, cheerio, pip. And That's I great. hear that now and I hear, I hear that pattern and I, I know now that it's a robin because of Kathy and those words that she helped us kind of remember them with. So I know there's some that are really helpful that way. Well, that gives you um, the cadence. That's a really good example. But if you don't know what a robin sounds like at all, um, you have to also learn the voice of a robin because if all, we, all you were to is to read those words and never see or hear a robin, uh, you, you probably don't have a, a mind image of the sound, mm -hmm. if, you, if you see what I'm, what I'm getting at. Yeah. So, but they can be very good for cadence. Like, so you can use it, but not quality. And that's my point, the voice. Like how whoever's listening to this, knows whether it's you or me right now they've learned our voice not just by the words we're saying but by the our tone and quality right and that's when you really get to know birds by voice or by right. sound very well uh there's an owl it's just going to give you another one uh barred owl has oh. who cooks for you who cooks for you all yeah okay so that works quite well well, and that works really well, especially because it's nighttime when you hear owls, so it's really hard to spot them. So you want to be able to ID owls and other sort of night birds, right? Right. Well, and they're already, it's already though, it's a, you know, it's going to be a who, <laughs> most likely, you know, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but if you were to take a, a bird, well, just to see, um, a song sparrow. It's a melodic series of songs, usually starting with two distinct phrases. Mm -hmm. Well, you could, we could, we could, we could fill a bucket full of bird names that <laughs> could could fit that. Yes. <laughs> but once you hear them repetitively, and and I, what I suggest is people start with their back door and the front door of their house. Mm -hmm. so what lives where you live. Yeah, so give us some examples of what we would hear right now in Salmon Arm. Okay, if we were to get up at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning right now, let's start <laughs> early in the day. <laughs> it sounds like my dad. <laughs> well, uh, at about 3 to 3.30 in the morning, you would be astounded at the number of robins singing throughout Salmon Arm right now. Mm. Whatever you think they say during the day, you haven't heard anything until you hear their pre-dawn chorus. Oh. Yes. Now I'm because of my interest in birds, I've developed the kind of mind that even if I'm sleeping, like one ear picks up when I hear out the window a bird <laughs> singing. So this is my um, insomniac period of the, <laughs> of the year when they're singing so early. But really, at uh, three between three and four, there's a robin chorus like you won't hear any other time of the day right and then around town that would shift over to probably uh house finches they're a beautiful sparrow sized bird uh, the males are sort of a, a a variable amount of um, raspberry red and the females are rather drab by comparison and they have a beautiful melo melodic series of warbles <laughs> you see so your best bet is to go to a source like eBird and listen to them oh. there. If you think, if you know, now that I've said they're really common, like if I walked out the door of my house right now in the middle of the day, I would hear one. Oh, okay. um, and then as the morning goes, as we go through the morning, there would be many, many different things. Uh, ravens, for example, although you may not call that a song, it's their communication. So they would croak and crows caw. And Salmon Arm is probably the best place on earth to separate the difference between the cro croakers and the cars. The oh, well, how do, you, how do you tell the difference between a croak and a caw? <laughs> well, if it goes very straightforward, caw, 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 it's a, it's a crow. It's a crow, okay. And if it does a various um, deep-throated croaks, I'm reluctant to actually <laughs> try an imitation. <laughs> But croak, you know, a very, very baritone croaks that you would never go ka, ka, ka. But when you basically learn the, the crow, and you can go anywhere in town and learn crows pretty well, uh, there's the crows, 
because, and then the, the ravens are the croakers, way lower tone. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that's a good place to start. And because we have both in abundance, you can practice. So now my, uh, when, when my granddaughter was four years old, she had that crow, raven, crow, raven, 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 crow. <laughs> and I, and I, yeah, they, she had, now of course she had a, she had me as a grandfather, she had, <laughs> but nevertheless, she got it right away. It was no, yeah. So that's, that's a tip there. Yeah. Uh, if as long as you think it's one of the two, then ask yourself, did it ka ka ka? Very straightforward, non-harmonic, or croak croak croak? Right. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Next, next on the list. So what other kinds of birds? Like I know there's a lot of chickadees and juncos and. Well, chickadee is also another fabulous bird right now to learn because they're singing. Now this uh, I just read an email from someone today who said was astounded that. Uh, what he thought was a chickadee song wasn't. It was a chickadee call. So when a chickadee goes chickadee dee dee dee, and again that's the cadence of it, chickadee dee dee, mm -hmm. it's saying I'm upset, get out of here, or go away. Uh, this is my food, or out of either. Basically, it's an alarm call. Oh, okay. Okay, and that's genetically determined. So a chickadee baby chickadee with never having heard another chickadee could make that alarm call hmm. so it's nothing to do with happiness it's the reverse it's not it's it's not happy about you or the cat that's nearby or something oh, okay but there's its song and the song is a vocalization used to either attract a mate or defend a territory so it's um it's, it's quite different functionally than a call. A call can be a whole variety of things, but a, a song is always to attract a mate or defend a territory. So the song of the black-capped chickadee doesn't sound anything like chickadee dee dee. It sounds like sweetie, two no, long notes. Oh, okay. Sweetie, with a quaver in the last. So it's yeah. a whistle, just a straight whistle. And they're doing that all over town right now. And they so start doing that like back in February. They do, back yeah. in February, absolutely right. And they, they, they keep it up. Now today, so I've been a couple times already today bird watching and uh, other common ones, we have all the warblers coming through like yellow rumped warblers, uh, Wilson's warblers. Uh, the, this, I think the, we should have Western Grebe as one of our symbols in Salmon Arm. The other one should be Nashville Warbler. Nashville Warblers are just everywhere in Salmon Arm. Really? Which I, which I find really interesting because they're a rare bird in Revelstoke. Oh. So well. I came here and went, wow, Nashville's. <laughs> well, you, we're quite different biogeoclimatically bio in Salmon Arm compared to Revelstoke. Yeah. yeah. So it isn't surprising we have differences in bird life, but this is the shockingly different it is really one of the commonest birds in salmon arm and probably one of the least known yeah because it is it's hard to see so um i guess i've seen one or two today and i've heard probably 15. oh wow so what do they sound like <laughs> well <laughs> yes well <clears throat> a, a, a series of notes on two different pitches so one little conversation, so, and I can't, you see, uh, this is where you need to hear them okay. or hear a recording of them, but basically a series of, of, uh, of kind of warbled stuttered notes that then breaks into another series at a different pitch. Okay. Like da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-
learn their voice. So again, back with our conversation, I'd know you now, no matter what you said. Yeah. By, by the, the quality and tone of your voice. Oh, okay, okay. And, well, that's, that's, and that's what you're trying to do then with the birds. <laughs> yeah, well, and that makes perfect sense because um, I've heard that before about other, other birds, other types of birds that um, their calls all sound different and then the uh, males, males to females. And um, yeah, so it's, you're right. It's important that we just learn what they sound like rather than the, the specific pattern of their call. Well, a bit of both. A bit of both, but too many of them have um, have different qualities and maybe similar patterns. Now, the, another just some other birds we'd be hearing this morning are uh, chipping sparrows. They're they're new on the scene. Chipping sparrows make a long, pro pro prolonged, mechanical insect-like buzz of notes. All right. Now, a junco makes a somewhat or trill. Of, mm -hmm. A junco makes a trill as well. And juncos and chipping sparrows often are in the same habitat and their songs can be very different or almost the same to the point where you go, I don't know, very experienced birders can go, I don't know which one it is. <laughs> huh. I, I had several that way this morning. Yeah. And, and what I do is I, I keep on checking myself. I think that's a chipping sparrow because it's more mechanical like and then I go and look, uh, it, was, it was a junco. Wow, I think it was, you know, it's gone. And I bet it was brought up near a, 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 you know, a chipping sparrow nest and it's learned the chipping sparrow song. <laughs> so it, it's quite involved and they, they have very intricate. I think one perspective people, it's well to have, is that uh, it makes sense that bird song is variable because they're trying to communicate different things. And also they're different animals and they can individually recognize each other. So they're, um, two birds that are nesting in adjacent parts of a woodland, they don't know just that it's another, say, yellow rump warbler. They know it's that yellow rump warbler. Mm. And then if a third yellow rump warbler shows up and sings in, their ter in the territory of these two, they know, oh, who's that? Like, this is, we haven't settled our boundary. Like, we haven't had the the, the uh, survey of the boundary line between our territories figured out. So this, this is something we're going to be upset about. So there's a lot of communication uh, going on that's very valuable. It must be very val valuable because why would a bird expose itself by being out on a limb announcing its location unless it was very valuable information it was transmitting? Right. Well, and then as we go through the summer, then of course the forests all fall fairly silent. And we don't hear much bird song at all. And I start getting more sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so what happens? So the flush of bird song is right now. And we're almost at full choir. The, I just this morning heard Pacific Slope fly, Flycatchers. And if anyone wants to hear what that, it's a thin slip. <laughs> That's it. Uh, go on eBird, Pacific Slope flycatcher and push this uh, listen button. They've just arrived uh, just a few days ago in my experience, but this morning I have three different places in town I found them. So it's just overnight, it's like they've come up from the tropics or the southern United States and now they're back. Wow. And it's another one that's, I've never heard one in 44 years in Revelstoke. I didn't have a single Pacific Slope flycatcher and I drive around Salmon Arm and oh, there's one out the window, like I'm getting them. <laughs> <laughs> at the corner because it's a very distinctive song and a bird's call that everyone can learn in salmon arm is the incredible call of the, the western grebe mm -hmm. they have a crick a crick kind of call that if you go to the wharf right now and just listen for this crick going on and if you're lucky there'll be one right below your feet doing it but they have started that you know, weeks ago and they'll keep that right up through uh, August. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and into September. And then you'll hear the correct still, but you'll hear the begging calls of the young. And if you again, watch off the, the wharf, you'll hear this incessant whining of the, of the young as they chase their, their parents around. And, and basically what they're saying is, feed me, feed me, feed me. 
And then every so often they get a, a fish down the throat <laughs> and they, they're, they're quiet for a few moments and then they, <laughs> then they go back at it. So the whole lake, it's quite wonderful. But start thinking of like, listen out on the lake, not just near the wharf. And you'll hear this crick, crick, crick. I can't do it justice. Ebird, click, listen, okay. <laughs> Western Grebe. And uh, so that's when everybody could, should learn in sam, salmon arm for sure. Is the, oh, definitely. Yeah, the wonderful sounds of the Western Grebe. Are there any other birds that we can make the sound and cause them to respond to us? Well, uh, the, the group that is easiest to do that, in my experience, is the, uh, the owls. But there, so for example, uh, the barred owl. <laughs> okay, sometimes it helps to have an echo chamber and a resonance chamber. You can do that, but I don't do it because bird song, bird song is really territorial advertisement in many cases. And if you get them to respond, what you basically are doing is interfering with their day. Yeah. And they can come at you, not because they're interested, they're interested in you, but in a very negative way. You can upset them and you can set them off calling as no, you know, get out they're, they're, They start hooting and oh, isn't it wonderful? But what really what you've done is you've set off uh, a whole bunch of um, uh, energy that they have to expand, expand dealing with you until they figure out it's a human trying to you know, imitate yeah, them. This is assuming that we've done a good job of the call, though. <laughs> right. And this is why also, I, so I usually, and if you, anyone who ever takes my courses would learn, I believe in the lowest impact possible uh, birding and never playing a bird song to the bird because of how much you can upset its day. Right. Right. And put it off doing other important things for it to do. Yeah. Um, so that's my personal philosophy. So right away, if you were, if you and I were to go out in the field and say, well, there, we don't make any imitations here. Now scientists will use recordings and do imitations as part of formal surveys and they do it in a very limited way. Uh, some parks in the United States, notably uh, in Arizona, uh, where the, there's the trogons, they won't even allow you to hi hike on the trails with a tape recorder hmm. because people use these recordings to draw the rare birds. Oh. And they do it so much, it could be detrimental to the birds. So I just like everyone to think of, you know, perhaps the gentlest way of seeing the birds is the, is the best and the non-disturbed way. Um, it, take, it takes a little more time for us, but it, it, I think it's lower impact, more responsible. Yeah, absolutely. On our part. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great way to close this interview, <laughs> this conversation, because uh, that's really all of our message, right? Is to thoroughly enjoy and experience the world around us, but in the most sustainable way possible, where we're not impacting other creatures' lives and we're just doing our best to keep everything healthy and safe for everyone. So thank you so very much, John. This has been really a delight and I've learned lots. And I actually, like my dad is a birder and he's taught me a lot, but I've learned things today, especially about the crows and the ravens. I'm going to listen more carefully now. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the Canadian, Canadian Tire parking lot and you'll have both. <laughs> them going by you, you see. So, it, okay, well, uh, a pleasure. And I hope everyone, get, now is the time to listen. Don't wait for July. They start to stop singing by July. Right now in the next six weeks, the very best time of the year. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And I hope you have lovely 3 a.m. mornings from here on. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye now.